All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Megan has told you, I'm Stephen Smallwood. Um, you can see there, uh, Deputy Finance Director of Birmingham Community Healthcare. Um, so Richard and Megan asked me to do um, a little brief introduction to pick up on um, some of the, you know, you know, basically what is the accreditation process about. Um, and apologies when I, I've got a couple of slides on that, you may already know some of the stuff. So um, I apologise for I repeat some of that. And then just some observations about why I got involved and uh, some of the differences um, that we've noticed in the organisation and the impact it's had as being part of the FFF process. So a little bit more about myself. I mean, I have been in the FFF process for probably about two and a half years now. Um, I, well, probably a bit longer than that, actually. I mean, as an organisation, we've been following FFF for probably three or four years. Um, but I really got involved um, when I sort of linked up with David Elcock, who I've seen is on the call somewhere, um, over a couple of years ago, and I signed up to be an assessor for the level two and level three um, accreditations. And I think, you know, I, when I did that, I was a bit of, went down a bit of a guilt trip route when I did it, because I was thinking, you know, I've, I've signed up here to be an assessor, but actually my own organisation has not really pushed this further forward. So it really gave me the impetus to actually get involved and I'll go on to a bit of that a bit later. Um, but since I signed up to become an, um, an assessor, I've now done three level two accreditations plus take on my own organisation through level one and level two. So hopefully I've built up a bit of experience during that that time. Do you have for the slide, Megan, please? Right, so this is, you know, so you've probably seen this before. So just, you know, what is accreditation? Um, you can see there it's um, an excellence accreditation process designed to allow the Finance Leadership Council. So for those of you who don't know, if you look them up on the uh, the Internet, you know, made up of some very senior people within the NHS, including. Um, I was going to say Julian, um, what's his surname? What's his surname? Help me. Julian Kelly from NHS England, NHSI, um, and a number of other sort of um, fairly well-renowned finance people. So, you know, to actually put an application in front of these people, um, you know, really, I think is a positive thing to show that your organisation um, is doing its best it can in terms of finance skills development and embedding the right culture within the organisation. Um, so next slide, please, Megan. So just a little bit about the um, the process. Again, you may have already seen some of this. Um, so the the process or the accreditation process is in three levels. Obviously, level one, two, and three. Um, and as you would expect, each of those levels get a little bit more involved and probably a little bit more complicated as you go through the process. Level one is um, effectively like a self-assessment type accreditation where you fill in a, a response to a number of uh, criteria and that is sent off to uh, to Megan and the team and they go through that criteria and assess whether they feel that you are um, ready to be accredited against level one based on the information you've provided. I always say to people when they do level one, um, I think a good tip is to actually, when you go through the level one process, you know, don't just fill the form in, but actually start to amass some of the evidence that goes along with that level one application because you will find when you get to level two there's a there's quite a bit of crossover between those first two levels and it always makes the level two process a lot easier if you've already got the um, evidence from level one uh, to hand um, so just a little tip there um, you know as you'd expect I said before you know the, the whole process you know it, it sort of gives recognition to the, the high standards I mean I think one of the things that really came out of this for us was that and I think we, we probably know dissimilar to any other finance department you know we, we do good stuff and you know generally as a finance community we do good stuff but we don't ever take the time to sit back and reflect on it and um, we probably just you know do something and then move on to the next um, pressing task and just don't take that time to reflect um, so I think you know for me this has really you know it's made us actually take the time to think you know actually we do do stuff that's good and uh, we should be giving ourselves a bit of a pat on the back for the, all the hard work that we do um, and that sort of links in with the next point really it's about the you know demonstrating financial competence 
Um, again, you know, there's a lot of stuff you know, say we do, and you know, we I'm sure we all do it to the highest possible standards. And by you know filling in the application form, it really does bring that out, and um, it just does make you appreciate what you do and who you do it for. Um, again, um, you know what what you expect from this accreditation is not just about you know doing doing the finance job, but it's all about the developing the the skills of the team as well. So you know it's you know don't underestimate the amount of time and effort you put into training your staff. And hopefully the um, you know the benefit that both you as an organisation and they get out of that long term. And then just just to finish off on this one, just a couple of things about the accreditation process. I mean, you probably again already know once you've been accredited at each level, those accreditations last for three years. Um, so obviously, if you've done level one this year, then it'll be come up for renewal in 2024 and so on with the other levels. And in terms of the assessment process and you know those of you who are thinking of going through the process the um the team run three assessments each year and they're typically uh, in april august and december so there's an expectation if you are going to submit an application it goes in on the last day of each of those months um so really i think you know in terms of the process i, I didn't want to say any more i mean you'll probably pick up other things as we go through this um so just move on to the next slide please wagon so, so the reason why why I got involved, I mean, I covered a little bit of this before, but you know, from, from my point of view, I say there was this bit of a guilt trip that, um, you know, I was an accredited assessor, but we hadn't really taken it forward in our own organisation. And for me, I felt that, you know, there was probably a little bit of a lack of motivation in the department. I mean, we got someone who was assigned as like an FFF lead, um, and you know the role that they had undertaken was to get some of the, the flyers that came through from the, the national team and circulate those around the staff within the department but we'd never really encourage people to become value makers or to become face colleagues um, and we really just sort of taken the information that was thrown at us and just circulated it and hope people had really got involved and you know for me that just wasn't doing what i wanted it to do um the other thing that I, you know, I, I did struggle with was um, we had a previous FD who had not signed the FD declaration, and I was having a bit of a, a battle to to get this signed. And as you'll probably know, that's a requirement of the the level one accreditation process to have that signed, or it has to be in place when you go through level one. Um, so. You know, we had a, a point in time where we had a, an FD change, and the new FD came in and was more than happy to uh, sign the declaration and was very supportive of the whole FFF process. And from that point in time, um, we sort of didn't look back really. Um, the one thing I think I found was quite interesting in going through the accreditations I've done, it seems to be that um, in some respects we we did the CCAB accreditations. The I won't say the wrong way around, but the the way around that a lot of people don't do it. So the accreditations I've been involved in, people have gone through the level one process and suddenly realised that they have to have accreditations in place with the CCAB bodies. Um, and that in itself can take a bit of time to get through those accreditations. And, you know, if, you, if you're if you looking to do level one and you haven't done that, then you need to sort of factor in probably four to six months to get those in place. But we'd actually done it the other way around. We got the CCAB accreditation. We'd had them for a, a long time. Um, and other than sort of using them for members of the finance department to help them get their, um, also when they fill the, the experience login at the end of their studies. I mean, we weren't really sort of using them for any other purpose than that. So, I mean, they, they just felt like we had them in place and then they actually served a purpose. In the sense that they, you know, helped us get through the level one process. And I've already said, you know, before, you know, there was a lot of things that we do that just went unrecognised. And what we've now done is we we've, we've sort of turned that round really, and we have a monthly finance team meeting. And now, as part of that finance team meeting, training and development and FFF becomes a standing item on that agenda, so that you know the whole. Um, you know the whole 
thing about FFF is just discussed across, you know, all the team. Everyone is aware of it. They know who um, the FSD lead is. They know who the uh, value makers are, and they're just, you know, far more aware of what's going on. I believe in terms of the, the field of FFF. Um, we've always had, you know, I think not just in the organisation, but you know, within the West Midlands as well, sort of strong links with FF, uh, sorry, with HFMA. Um, and that just, you know, seemed to fit in with FFF as well, you know, bringing the two together. And I think finally, you know, the one thing when I sort of, you know, as I said to you, I, I got involved as a, a value maker when I started the process. I then became a regional value maker for the West Midlands probably about 12 months ago, 18 months ago. And the thing that sort of struck me then was that, you know, the accreditation in the West Midlands certainly we weren't one of the highest achieving um, regions in the country. So we wanted to do a bit of work to try and turn that around. And I think we've made some quite good progress in those 12 months. Um, so yes, that was you know a bit about why I got involved, um, just the motivation for it. If you just look over this, Megan to the final slide. Right, so again, I, say, I think I've probably already mentioned some of this. So, you know, as I said, I initially got involved um, through David as a level two, level three assessor. And as I said, I've actually been through three level two assessment processes. So, you know, I've got a bit of experience um, in that. Uh, as I said, I involved as a value maker. Uh, and I think, you know, the thing for me, you know, the impact this has had on us as a department, you know, it's certainly, it has enabled us to build wider contacts either through the assessments I've done or people um, engaging in the value maker um, network. And we certainly found, um, you know, a big improvement there. But for me, you know, going back to the finance team meeting, the one thing that um, I suppose it surprised me really in many senses was when I started the accreditation process. Um, I mean, I, the one thing you, you know, you, you probably shouldn't overlook is that you know, this accreditation process, it can't really be done by one person. You really need to have a team within the department on site to, to help you through this. Um, and I went out, you know, to our team and you know, said, I'll need someone to help me do this, whether it's, you know, pulling together the evidence, um, et cetera. And I was hoping I might get sort of two or three people to help me. And I was fortunate enough, I think I ended up with 10 or 11 people in the end who formed um, a staff engagement group. And what we've now done is we've used that group not only as a, a group to go through the FFF process, but it's all widened out into a, a more of a finance training group. So that group um, also looks at things like um, study leave policies and any other policies. Uh, we've looked at an investment policy, a treasury management policy. So it has been widened out into something a lot more useful in the organisation. Um, and, you know, just to, to finish up what I wanted to say, you know, clearly, you know, we weren't really recognising some of our own good work, but, you know, this process has now turned that round for us. I mean, you know, when we, certainly when we had our level one accreditation confirmed, we had, all the finance team together and we had a, a photograph with us being presented with the certificate which was nice I mean something we'd never done before unfortunately sort of COVID got in the way we weren't able to do that at level two but we certainly got it um, flagged up as part of the weekly bulletins within the organization so you know if we couldn't get a photograph in a in a trust sort of magazine at least we got it out there on the trust internet and you know finance department were able to or shout about their successes and you know for me it was pleasing you know going, going back to where I, I sort of said a couple of minutes ago there wasn't a big engagement within the in the West Midlands I mean I, we were quite I think quite pleased as an organization that when we got through level two we were the first trust within the West Midlands along with another one, another one at the same time but you know we were in the first cohort of trust in the West Midlands to achieve level two accreditation so you know we felt that um you know, we'd done a good job and the whole process really had brought the finance department together. And we now feel, I think in my view, a lot more of a, um, a sort, you know, we feel more of a, a combined entity and, you know, we, we understand things and share ideas and thoughts and uh, learning material. And it just, you know, for me has been a, 
a big benefit to the, the whole of the process. But I'll stop there because I think there's there's something else later on about benefits. So I won't go too much into that. Um, so really, that was all I wanted to say. I mean, hopefully, it's what uh, Megan and Richard wanted. So if there's any questions anybody had on that, um, I think we've got a few minutes. I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was great. Um, yeah, as Stephen said, has anyone got any questions on that session? Feel free to pop your hand up or pop it in the chat if you didn't want to speak out. So I was just choking. I see there's, there's a couple there, Megan. There's uh, Jeanette Karen? first. Jeanette, oh, so, oh, sorry. So Jeanette was top of my list. So Jeanette. Hello, um, thanks Stephen for that. Um, I just wondered actually, because we've just started our journey along the pathway, um, um, part of our issue at the moment is people working at home and trying to get that engagement mm. whilst people are off site. Um, and I just wondered what you thought about that really, whether, whether that was going to be a hindrance? Um, probably not. I mean, I suppose, you know, from, from my own personal point of view, we did the level one accreditation when we were all in the office, but um, our level two was done and we, we were accredited level two in December 2020. So the whole of our level two application was done while we were working at home. And, you know, to be honest, now I, I think, you know, I'll go back to the point I said about moving from level one to level two and um, particularly getting the accreditation at level one lined up before you go into level two. I mean, a really big thing that helped us was having that in place i mean if we hadn't have had that in place then you know working from home might have been a problem but you know we hadn't um, obviously didn't foresee covid coming but you know we were lucky that you know a lot of the evidence from level one was already there it was already <clears throat> sort of filed in a folder and you know we we had a i suppose we had a bit of an advantage that we had a starting point at least to commence our level two accreditation so might have been fortunate but it certainly helped us but you know we you know by the time we got into it we were all sort of familiar with using teams so it really didn't feel like much different to us all getting together in an office really um you know we we, we did the meetings I, I took notes of them i shared those notes around with the members of the group um, we, we agreed some action points and we followed those up we had the meetings every month and we just followed up the action points part way through the meetings just to make sure everyone was on track and was putting together the information that we tasked them to do so so really i don't i don't think it's a you know working from home is a reason not to do it i mean i think you can do it perfectly um as successful as easy as you could if you're working in the office to be honest thank you i just wanted to get your perspective I, i'm sure it's not a reason for not doing it at all but no, i just no, wondered no. if there was um things we needed to think about specifically but that, that's fine thank you no I mean I think as long as you've got the people in the team who are you know willing to to be involved and you know I was fortunate I had a, a good bunch of people who were willing to be involved that for me was you know 90 percent of the battle really it was getting that engagement and yeah you know that they all you know wanted to be involved they all signed up as value makers as part of the process um so yeah so I was maybe I was a bit lucky I had the um you know, I had the, the interest from people and then it, it was fine. Thank you. OK, um, Karen, I think there's next one. Yeah, um, we unfortunately have let let our C CC AB accreditation lapse. So what would your advice be? Because we're, we're very early on in the journey. Would, would you suggest that we yes. concentrate on the CCAB and then look at the um, level one accreditation or can you do it um, side by side? Um, I think you can do it side by side. I mean, clearly, you know, when you get through to submitting your level one application, there is an expectation that you um, have those certificates in place. I think I, I mean, Richard may contradict me here. I think I've seen the odd application that's sort of been approved pending um, a CCBA qualification going through where they've got very close to, to having it done. So there might be you know, where you've submitted your application to, say, SEMA, for instance, and they've come back with a couple of points that you're just following up on. So as long as you can demonstrate you have most of them in place and have made significant progress towards getting that done, I mean, but, you know, the, the central team will advise on that. Um, 
but yeah, but you know, as I said, you know, don't don't underestimate the amount of time. I mean, I it, it felt for me that um, we did, I think we did ACCA first, then followed by CIFA. Sorry, followed by SEMA, then followed by CIFA, and it almost. And I'm sure there's no one. I hope there's no one from the accountancy the bodies on the call. I hope there isn't. But it almost felt to me as though you know, whichever way you did ACCA or SEMA, if you got the accreditation with one or the other, and then could demonstrate, you know, if you if you got SEMA in place and could demonstrate to ACCA that you'd already been to the SEMA process, ACCA seemed a little bit more lenient in their signing off of it. And I've heard sort of the um, the same story, you know, the other way around, where someone's done ACCA first and SEMA have been a little bit more lenient. Um, and the SIPFA process, I mean, I, you know, my I'm actually SIPFA qualified. They seem to be the um, the easiest one to get through, which I felt was a bit disappointing personally. But um, but yeah, but you know, just you know, you've got to do the two side by side. Um, but you know, don't underestimate that. And I, I'll just see before we go to um, Vishal, I see David Alcock's got his hand up. So he's probably going to contradict everything I've just said now, <laughs> David. Absolutely not, Steve. No, it's just to let people know that SIPFA have currently suspended their accreditation process. So um, I'm not quite sure what uh, what what Rich and the and the and the guys at FFF are doing, but in the Northwest, this is where Jackie might come in and contradict me. But we've said that we'll let people be accredited without the SIPFA um, accreditation as long as they go on to get that as soon as it's available again. Okay, thank you, David. I just, I just, sorry, I'm sorry, um, do you have to have accreditation from all the CCA bodies, even if you don't have anybody who's a member of them, just the ones that you are members of? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a fish. Is it Vishali? Hi. Uh, sorry. Um, so I don't. I joined a bit late, so apologies for that. And I don't know if my question might have already been answered, but I just wanted to know what. Uh, when are the revised submission dates for the evidence to support their accreditation? When did, so when are the dates to submit? Yeah, the revised submission dates for the evidence. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I said on my slide, I think it's still, if, if I'm answering the right question, the submission dates are April, August and December every year. I mean, Megan might, if I've yeah. misinterpreted that, Megan might be able to step in. Uh, yeah, no, I think you're answering the right question there. So the next deadline will be the 31st of August and that will be reviewed at FLC in September. And then the next one will be 31st of December, which will be reviewed in the FLC of January 2022. Um, I'm just going back a point as well to what David was talking about, about SIPFA. Um, we have also in the national team decided to take SIPFA off of the requirements as they're, whilst they're reviewing their process. Um, for anyone that was wondering about that as well. OK, thank you. Um, is Jeanette's hand up? Is that an old hand, Jeanette, or do you have another question? Sorry, yeah, that's the legacy. Okay. OK, so I think I don't think we have any more questions, Megan, so looks like okay. we go over to someone else. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, thank you for your time. Our next session is Shek Moten, and he has just achieved his level one accreditation with Kent and Medway CCG. Um, so he's going to speak to us about what are the benefits that he's seen from the application process and achieving it. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, I've got a. Can I bring a slide up? Is that OK? I'm, uh, we've only just achieved it, so I've tried to put something together very quickly um, while we're speaking most of the time. Hopefully we do a bit of a and a which might be a better way of um, tapping into my brain. Um, if I just bring up a slide, if that's OK. Yeah, of uh, course. Let me know if you can all hear me clearly. I haven't got a microphone on I'm using the laptop. Uh, here we go. If I can do slideshow. Yeah, we can see that check. Excellent. Thank you. So I was asked to um, uh, just talk about our, um, uh, not necessarily the journey because that's been already covered, but some of the benefits uh, from a from a finance director perspective. And Ivor, my chief executive, uh, chief uh, finance officer, was going to do this, but he's got a governing body today. So he asked me to. Um, uh, just cover. So bear with me. Um, uh, I have been leading on this, but to be honest, it, it isn't me who did this. It's the team. 
Um, my role is to lead, uh, provide the facilitation and an environment where people can actually achieve these things. And that's what I've been doing. Um, in terms of a quick sort of background, very quickly uh, in, in my role. So um, I've been involved with finance development for a very long time. I was um, very much involved with the finance um, uh, development uh, in, in London uh, for a number of years um, and in and out of future focus finance. Um, so I left uh, London about uh, four years ago now to join Ken and Medway, uh, then Medway CCG um, as the chief finance officer. Uh, in, and in the recent reorganization, I've taken one of the roles as uh, a director of finance for strategy and system commissioning, but with a clear leadership on finance development. Um, so that's kind of a, a 30 second kind of journey of who I am, where I am. Um, so I think it might be worth just uh, giving a bit of a context uh, to Kent and Medway, which is one of the largest systems uh, in the country of the 42, I think now, uh, around 2 million population. We've got about two large um, acute trust, uh, one in East Kent, one in uh, Maystone. Um, Two small acutes, a large community across the county, um, well respected, uh, one large mental health. Uh, there is a, a CIC as well. Um, and we've moved from one, eight CCG to one on um, in April 2020. Um, and that's uh, that process has been a very protract, uh, protracted uh, reorganization, which kicked off. Uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, it's the STP program that kicked off a number of those journeys back in 2015. Uh, in Kent, the journey started in 2017, um, moving towards a, a sort of like a um, uh, subgroup level uh, of CCGs and then finally moving to one single CCG legally merged with a single team on the 1st of April 2020. Um, at a time uh, when we were in the middle of a pandemic, um, and as you know, um, Ken's famous for its um, variant. Um, so we have been very busy in that time. Um, so very challenging, challenging environment coming from a very fragmented system. Um, uh, number of organisations, number of teams uh, going through reorganisation uh, remotely pretty much for most of that time. Uh, and finally, we did uh, go through the consultation process in October 2020. Uh, when we came out the other end, uh, beginning of November, uh, we were in a position where uh, the finance team were coming together around 65 odd people down from about 85. So uh, most of that we've managed to achieve through vacancies. So uh, uh, luckily there were no redundancies. Nonetheless, people are um, uh, been through a lot in that time, I think, uh, especially when you're moving teams around and individuals. Um, so it was a good moment to, I suppose, to think about um, as a team, as a finance department, now that we're a larger organisation, which lends itself to much more structure in terms of finance development and um, uh, expertise, um, is what do we do next in terms of taking it forward? So I've, I've managed to twist either the Chief Finance Officer's arms to start thinking about signing up to Future Focus Finance. Now, Future Focus Finance um, uh, accreditation, partly for me, it's about a catalyst and the catalyst to make a number of other changes uh, that we always think about and plan, including CPD accreditation, but we never do. Um, and this was, a, this was a way of signing up to something that will move us into that sort of journey. So if I, we kicked off uh, as either on the on your right, it should be with Simon on the left, signing the declaration back in um, uh, early part of November, which kicked which sort of kicked off the journey. And the other thing we did at the same time was also start thinking about um, trying to do this from grassroots, um, get people involved from right from the. Uh, bottom of the organisation or the department, as well as uh, from top, but very much led by uh, teams uh, and colleagues um, uh, who are emerging as new talent. Um, and so, uh, we, I had a, I, I, I launched a a, a value maker session. Uh, at that point in time, we had one value maker. Um, 
And so I borrowed a few from our Southeast, Southeast region, uh, Stuart, one of our FSD leads and a couple of other colleagues to set up a session to have a session with the value makers. And I think for us, it was more about, we've been through a lot, many of our teams have as well, is, is demonstrating that the finance, um, finance uh, function and the profession as a group and a network isn't just about 70 or 80 people within Kent, uh, CCG, it's about the total number of people, the 15 or 16,000 people who work in NHS finance. Um, and it's kind of showing some hope about where we all need to be given our um, organisations uh, and, 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 the, and, and the sector that we work in is always going to be constantly changing and evolving, um, whereas the skill set of finance colleagues are still needed, it just needs to be adopted. So that's why we kicked it off. Um, in terms of uh, following on from that uh, value maker session, um, some of the other things that led to um, work within that six months were uh, achieving uh, accreditation from all the professional bodies, apart from SIPA for the reasons that David uh, already alluded to. Uh, we have only one SIPA member who's retiring in a, in a month or so. So um, uh, we will not have anyone after, after August, uh, uh, after, after July. Um, so we've got accreditation. Uh, we've also uh, managed to get the number of value makers up to eight at the moment, which is about 15% of our finance department. Our level one also sits in the context of Kent and Medway, which has uh, one of the largest number of organisations within the Southeast region with uh, future focused finance accreditation. In Kent, uh, all our organisations are level one apart from two, and uh, one is at level two. There are two more who are aspiring to be level two uh, towards end of this year. So I think we're very much in a good place as a as a system, and I think for us as a CCG, it's great to be part of that network and table. Uh, and I think it's a first for Kent and Medway. None of the eight CCGs. Uh, in the past had any accreditation, whether it's future focused finance or professional bodies. So for me, that's a massive achievement. And what it does is, I suppose it creates a platform for the finance uh, director and the organization to step up, demonstrate talent, learn. Um, and we were, as a department, selected as part of a, a pilot um, development program within the organization, one of three to test some of the management development um, and directorate development um, tools. Um, it's, and it's because we were able to demonstrate that we are a learning directorate and, and there's a long way to go, uh, but we're already thinking about level two uh, and, and beyond. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, one of the benefits and challenges was, um, and I'm sure you'll come across this, is making sure that you've got a very good study and training policy. Um, for us, um, we had to consolidate eight of them to one and come up with something that is um, appropriate and beneficial to all. We managed to get that through and that really helped to demonstrate value and our commitment to, to our staff, which, which I have a promise within that declaration. And that was one of those early kind of wins to show to the teams that we are really serious about this, as opposed to just ticking a box. Uh, we, we're not really in this for ticking a box. This is a genuine improvement plan to our to our organisation and our and our, and our, um, um, our, de our de department. Um, I'm really sorry. I don't think the slides are moving forward um, when you're clicking through them. You um, see, that's my last slide. But uh, we're still on the first the, slide. <laughs> are you still no, on the first one? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, There's no problem though, don't worry. If we're if we're at the end, we can go into a QA. Can you, can you, can you see it better now? Uh no, just we're still on the um introduction. Sort of, yeah, into the on your first towards oh yeah, there you go. It's moved along now. Okay, so the slide uh, thank you for telling me that. That's Everyone okay. been silent for all that time. Typical <laughs> finance people, isn't it? You don't say anything. Um so I will uh yes, yeah, sorry, apologies. So that's why I was talking about the context. Uh, I hope it makes sense. I mean, you've got similar one of those for your own patches. Um, so you missed this bit. I think this is really the key part. This is really the key part in the sense of the chief finance officer committing to um, and publicly declaring, and this is all over the internet, uh, with Simon, his commitment to staff development and finance development. 
And I think it's uh, it's been a it's, it's been a credit to Iva, um, and as, as one of the key benefits for me, I think that I've moved Iva from uh, well, looking certainly being playing a big part in finance development within Future Focus Finance, but also he's been selected into the newly created or revamped rather uh, Finance Leadership Council as as a rep from the Southeast region, and he's really passionate about this at the moment and. Uh, at the moment, uh, he's just sent me a note to say he's just about to uh, sign up as a value maker. Uh, kind of left it a bit late, but that's what he needs to do, and he's doing that right now. Um, and I think that's very important. I think it's very important to get this um, commitment from right from the top. Uh, and uh, recently, we've had um, our chief exec uh, uh, for the for the CCG as well as the system and the emerging ICP ICS. Uh, absolutely very excited about the achievements that we have made within finance and more to do uh, given the circumstances we've been through a brutal reorganization within a pandemic delivering year-end delivering planning um, and we managed to also thanks to future focus finance get accreditation within a space of six months um, and also accreditation from the professional bodies for both students and members um, so I think it's an amazing achievement and the, and the organisation is very much uh, excited about this. It also fits in with the organisational development itself uh, as becoming a more learning organisation um, as we move into a formal ICS in April. Um, and so it fits in with a moving from a fragmented organisation I mentioned earlier here to one that is collaborative and within the financial principles that we've agreed across the system. I was just sharing an example, which I apologize you didn't see it. Uh, one of the other products that we, we we launched is, and I'm sure everyone else has that, is a um, uh, a staff bulletin. So we have our own CCG one, but we wanted to create one for finance, and it was just an idea I had. I spoke to one of my value makers, um, and uh, we we thought, you know, the, the, having ideas and actually someone making it happen. Uh, was amazing because uh, here, here we had a value maker recently very passionate about development. She's been in the in the organisation before for a long time, but suddenly stepped up, and you can see the talent coming through. So I kind of facilitated uh, her to lead this, and within 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 a few weeks, uh, we have a value maker group uh, who came up with a prototype of a, um, a newsletter. So these are the benefits from just just, just working towards accreditation, um, and we we put it out to the entire team uh, to ask the, for their comments, uh, ask for what name we should have, and we had a whole load of people come back with names. And in the end, we went for the majority finance matters. There are many others. Uh, creative accounting was one of them. Um, so I, I think it's about I suppose what I, the example I'm trying to give here of benefit is. Engaging the wider organization, well, organization as well as the wider finance department, and it isn't just a, a tick box exercise within a group of few enthusiasts. And I think that's really the key. And this goes right to the heart of this. Is I, I mean, I'm I'm calling this a, a grassroots movement uh, in this organization for me. Um, the so I mean, it, it's there in terms of. Clearly, uh, we've just achieved, I think, uh, formally uh, last week, um, the level one. Um, but we've also got the, uh, as part of that byproduct, working with the professional bodies to get the accreditation, and we, which is very, very important to our finance teams, uh, especially um, not only trainees, but the qualified members uh, who are very, uh, you know, the CPD process can be quite challenging for some, some, some professional body members. So I think it's been a, a great achievement. Um, and I suppose that's how you get people engaged, you know, what, what's in it for me? And you can see that this is a great news for the organisation, great news for the system, great news for individuals in a, in a, in a system that is, you know, um, a stone throws away from London. So attracting talent is quite difficult, um, but this allows us to market ourselves as a system to attract more people locally. Uh, and we would flex for working uh, uh, from elsewhere, um, but also it gives a demonstration of our, us as a finance function, part of the national NHS, uh, national uh, health service family, how we 
support the front line, which is really the bit that adds value for me. Um, and we have a lot to offer. Um, so those those are the kind of uh, key key benefits. As I've said, it's, it's a beginning of the journey as opposed to an end. But I think we put Kent uh, commissioning system uh, on the development map. I think for the first time, our um, uh, operational and front frontline colleagues, both uh, within the system and within the CCG, recognise that um, the finance function is one that can add value and a professional a learning finance function uh, will adopt to the changes that uh, that um, take place within within the NHS and elsewhere on a regular basis. I think um, it's a very, very good place, uh, good time to be in Kent at the moment. Um, and I'm very, very proud, proud to be here. So I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, that was a quick 16 minutes. Um, I can go on forever. And apologies, I don't have lots of slides to talk about, but I'm happy to uh, talk it through through a Q&A session. Thanks very much, Shep. That was really interesting and congratulations again on achieving your level one. Does anyone have any questions at all? Uh, Karen? Yes, thank you for that. That was very interesting insight. I'm interested to know how you kept the team motivated because Clearly, they were, were going through um, other changes at the same time. So I'm interested to know how you how you kept that momentum going. Yeah, so, so as I said, it was uh, very much a, grass, a grassroots um, uh, approach. Uh, the, the, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, get people signed up to value makers, including myself. Um, but I think the, the key is once people start to particularly emerging talent, and you, you'll have them. You might not notice them, but they're there. They're right at the coalface. Uh, once you get them infused, I think that it's like a runaway train. You can't stop. And I was fortunate enough to have, have one or two people who were really keen to drive this. And I, what I did as a director is make sure that I created uh, space and time uh, and making sure that uh, you know, Iva was, uh, and that's why right at the beginning, that declaration isn't a piece of paper that was signed up. And I was really conscious I'm going to make that public, and I did. And I was really up for that, and he created space for people to be able to do this. So I think it's getting a, a to start with a bunch of people who are really uh, willing to champion this and then see the benefits for themselves as well. And the Future Focus Finance Value Maker Network is a really useful place because that's what drives people, the connections. I think we were fortunate enough also, the networking was far more easier, perhaps uh, working virtually than if you're in an office. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, do we have any other questions at all before we move on? No, I can't see any hands. I do have one question for you, actually, Shek. Um, sure. Do you find that, have you found that becoming accredited has helped for your organisation to prepare for the move to the new ICS structure? Um, I, I think definitely for the reasons that I've described, it's about, uh, I think for us, we've had so much learning over the last 12 months, uh, certainly the teams, you know, for me, it's different. I've been around the block, uh, uh, but for many people who work outside of London, um, you kind of uh, been in certain places for, for a very long time uh, and uh, so sometimes you see those changes sometimes you don't but what it's helped is I think uh, I call it um, I'm quite keen the finance director to be what I call brand uh, you know build their brand so whatever the changes come across in the future whether it's an ICS or a next form of a reorganization in three or four, four years time the finance individuals do not feel insecure. They take that as an opportunity for the reasons that I've described by looking after themselves as an organ uh, and as a, as a team. I think that as a finance function, we are far more prepared, resilient, um, and actually looking forward to that challenge uh, because we can see how we could shape that. Um, and the other thing, uh, the benefit that we've had is it's also opened up the uh, organizational finance department at all levels rather than just the director level to have much more connection with the rest of the NHS organisations. So we're looking beyond just the NHS, looking at 
our system from a, you know, we are one of the largest employers in Kent. The NHS is one of the largest employer, uh, followed by local government. Um, and it's trying to see, get some partnership in that. So I think in the ICS world, where the partnership is beyond just the NHS, it puts us in a very good place and also huge amount of opportunity for individuals who are going through this uh, uh, process of self-discovery, confident and bringing those talent out of the woodwork. Thank you, Shek. That's really good insight to your view on the upcoming changes. And thank you for your session. It was really great and for your time. Our next session is going to be from Daryl Cockman and Simon Oliver from ESNEFT, who have just achieved their level two accreditation. So congratulations to you. And this session is going to be about how has accreditation improved our finance team? Thank you, Megan. Uh, Hi everyone. Just a little bit of context. So ESNEF is a large acute trust. We have about 240 staff in our department, of which around 190 are sort of pure finance. Um, so I'm employed purely on training and development. I work part time. So it would be fair to say that I took a major, major leadership role in, in getting us to level two. Uh, but just to demonstrate, it wasn't a one man band. I brought Simon along to, to sort of tell us about um, one of the specific areas that we looked at where, where we could demonstrate benefits by going through the process. A couple of things just to reflect on. Um, the paperwork has recently been revised and I think it is much more helpful where it's having your level one, level two, level three sitting next to each other by sort of discipline. And that way, it, you know, because it is a progressive um, accreditation, it's much more helpful to sort of see the information sitting there. And so a reflection from me, I achieved level one with NHS England. Uh, ESNEF had got a level two before I joined them. Um, so I actually produced the level two accreditation paperwork without that much reference to the level one paperwork. Uh, and that that was a disbenefit of lockdown because it was very difficult to track down where the information was. Uh, but we managed to work our way through it, so that was fine. Um, I guess the um, the other thing that what I'm going to say is I'll take you through a few sort of personal developments for myself, how the department's developed, and then Simon's going to um, take you through some specifics. I'm then just going to talk about the assessment process. Hopefully I won't touch, touch up too much on Dave, David Elcock's presentation, but just a reflection of how that went and, and how you can use that as a positive as well. Um, so one of the things that we've sort of worked out as a result of going through the process is, is that we haven't got a structured way of collecting non-mandatory training and development. Um, we have information from the HFMA, we have the information from the Skills Development Network, and I have to play around with it to, to present it back to, to staff. And what we want to do is um, provide an information system that allows staff to see what they've got and allows managers to see, and it helps in their one-to-one -one discussions and appraisals, but also um, we can provide a departmental analysis. Uh, so we're sort of busy working on that at the moment, but the paperwork and and by going through the process allowed us to see that that was, that was a gap and it was a gap, you know, that we weren't plugging in the most efficient and effective way. And, and some of the developments, and Simon may well touch upon it, that we're learning now is allowing us to build a product that will be efficient and effective in sort of recording that and presenting it back going forward. Um, the other thing that I feel that um, we weren't doing well enough and this process has allowed us to improve was, was actually being open about what we were doing. So my two examples are certainly the training and development. We hadn't really produced a here is a review of our training development activities. 
this is how it cuts around a department. Um, so as part of that process, I produced that document. Again, it was cobbling that information together, not in the best way that I wanted to. But again, by just going through that process, it enabled us to say, right, where are the gaps? How can we how can we address that going forward? And now we've got a plan to do that. Um, the other thing that we had and another learning point, and this was another issue that came out of our level one is our development strategy was not. Um, uh, it had been produced as part of level one. But it hadn't been followed through and then um, shared with staff. Um, so as part of level two, it was refreshed and it has been shared with staff. So our ability to communicate with staff, um, I guess, has improved as a result of lockdown. We were split over two sites as a department uh, and communications um, wasn't always the best. With Teams, our communications are hugely improved. We have a monthly meeting with our finance director live. We regularly have over 100 staff on that. We have monthly health and wellbeing calls. We have close to 100 staff that attend those. So, um, yeah, and we use some of the information within the accreditation templates to sort of drive how we discuss things and talk about things. The last thing that I'll talk about before I hand over to Simon is about celebrating success. Uh, I joined the trust in March uh, and it was one of the things that I'd said as part of my um, interview is that I'm going to yeah, start looking to celebrate our success and um, it was really easy to find people that were doing great stuff, you know, doing things outside of the box for, um, you know, in terms of COVID, um, volunteering to support clinical staff as part of COVID. So the Value Maker Awards were coming up. We had a go at those. We were shortlisted on a, on a I think two or three, but we didn't win. But that, but that was a positive start. We then um, submitted for the HFMA National Awards. We made three submissions. Uh, I think we were shortlisted in two, and we won, we won the governance one, which uh, and. There were a number of us on the HFMA conference and exchanging sort of congratulations through teams when it was announced that we'd won. It was, it was, it was, it was quite special, really. Um, and I hope that in, it encourages us to sort of move, move that on. So um, we got regional team of the year and uh, Simon was part of that team. Um, and we put in applications for public finance awards. So, so the process has galvanised us to say, what are we doing that's really good? How can we celebrate it? Um, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can reflect that in being shortlisted and possibly winning other awards going forwards. Um, but as a result of winning, I've been asked to be a judge on the HF awards this year. So again, it's another benefit and improvement to our department and kudos for our department that I, I've been asked and you know my director of finance was chuffed to bits that I'd been asked to get involved um, so it so it's like a bit of a domino effect you know you get on you get on the first step and you move your way up I'll stop there for a second and I'll pass you on to Simon that will sort of talk about a specific and go into perhaps a little bit more detail Hey, nice right, step in there. Talking of high profile, I think we've had Boris on site today as well, Daryl, if you haven't clocked that one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Um, so some of you may or may not have seen some of the stuff that I do in terms of on previous presentations around some of the Power BI side of things. So I'm a tech, there's no hiding that. Um, in terms of a bit of the structure, we might be slightly different to some of the NHS organisations that uh, I cover central financial reporting, but I also oversee payroll and ESR, because I know traditionally some of those functions can sit within the um, HR remit. Um, I will obviously say I'm an accountant, I'm not a HR professional, but it brings a different mindset potentially to some of those specialties and disciplines. 
And that's sort of where the right to retire toolkit as part of the FFF has been quite quite useful. Um, so, so some of the things since taking on that team has been sort of trying to move them into perhaps some of the finance mindsets um, with regards to sort of electronic work, ways of working. I think that's been one of the sort of keys because obviously the hard to retire talk is quite comprehensive and it's about sort of picking the bits out of it that are perhaps the easiest wins. So some of the things that we sort of focused on was around electronic rostering um, because obviously that will do away with a lot of paper timesheets. Um, we also utilised the expenses system and adapted that where perhaps the rostering couldn't be deployed in certain areas to um, allow managers to submit other things electronically and for us to kind of um, process it through that way. Um, a good example of that is we all got thrown home to work from home and suddenly um, we allowed some of the staff to claim various miscellaneous expenses for setting themselves up at home, so desks, chairs, those sorts of things because the trust couldn't actually facilitate procuring them and getting them shipped home quick enough. So to get the staff home, we allowed them to um, order it off Amazon and claim it back. So sort of by, by moving on the fly, should we say, we're able to move things quite, quite quickly. So the primary focus has been sort of looking to sort of remove away from paper. That's not exactly rocket science to accountants, um, but that's one of the things that we've utilised. There are some pros and cons of removing paper. Um, so one of the sort of big negatives is you've got these great big electronic uploads that you put into ESR where you're putting them into if you're sort of uploading a journal and you accidentally put it backwards or you accidentally miscode it no damage you can reverse it you spot it you put something through wrong on ESR and you're paying people they'll, they'll hit their bank accounts could result in overpayments underpayments so by moving processes from paper to electronic you need to make sure the governance processes are tight and that's one of the things the hire to retire toolkit sort of reminds you of that you need to have a look at the governance processes um, I will say, hands up, we have we have made a boo boo on one or two of those, which is why I'm highlighting them, but uh, just so people are aware. So, um, I mean, one of the things it's allowed us to do by moving all of this stuff electronically is it has allowed some of the electronic accruals. So, if I pick out um, doctors' additional session timesheets are now being submitted electronically, so it then allows us to figure out what's been paid on the payroll by having it under finance and what hasn't, so therefore we can accrual. That's what calls the balances. We are also just at the moment releasing um, budget information via ESR. Um, so we have actually utilised position post functionality within ESR. It was there when it was created in 2004, just never actually used or deployed. So what we're able to do is basically download the ESR data set and um, provide budget managers with a full listing of all of their posts uniquely identified. Um, with budget against them. So we can centrally distribute staff lists. So finance teams don't have to do that any longer. We can use an automatic email cascade to fire that out. And it'll also give them accurate information. So we're a bit late for May, but for June, we will be um, firing out the staff list for June in June before the payroll. So if there are any staff on there who have left or shouldn't be getting paid, we can have it identified early. Um, and it's also a start, it also takes pressure off the month end when you're reporting vacancy figures and the like. Um, but by having that data electronically, it allows us to do a whole load of other things to it. And I'm just mindful of my time slot here, but there's a whole heap of stuff we're doing with our position pub post because eventually we can have a look at how we can do the costings, how it integrates with the agency data. Because obviously, if you've got the position data, you can actually link agency bookings into those positions to check that they are actually vacancies, that type of stuff. There's a whole heap of other bits on there, but I promise Meg and I will come back and do a presentation at next year's FFF thing on what we're up to on Power BI, but there's a whole heap of other stuff that we're doing, but because we've got this electronic, we can do it. Um, hopefully I've covered off most people's points on that one. So, Daryl? Thanks, Simon. That's really helpful. So the only other thing I wanted to just touch on was the uh, the assessment process and our experience of that. Uh, obviously, at level two, you're getting a peer assessment. And, um, you know, obviously that was a new process for myself and the two people that were assessing us, um, it was new to them. So we very much worked together through it. Uh, you know, I was really interested in the process. Uh, so I shadowed their meetings. Uh, when we had um, interviews with our team, so we had to have 40 staff 
So trying to encourage 40 staff to give up their time to get involved in a meeting um, was a bit of a struggle, at, um, but we got there. And I have to say, all I said to the staff was to be open and honest. You know, if there's something that you're not happy about, I don't mind you telling us because we want to learn and we want to move forward. Um, and the staff were brilliant. Um, you know, I couldn't have prepped them better in terms of how supportive they were of our appraisal process, of the work that we'd done to try and improve things as a department over the last 12 months. And it was consistent. We had, you know, because of the number of staff we needed to see, we had to have four meetings. Um, and there was consistency through that. We got non-clinicians to come in. Um, I had to put my hand up and say that I did have to explain, you know, what, what, why they were coming, you know, what they needed to, to sort of talk about. I stressed again that, you know, if there are things they weren't happy about, they would have had an opportunity to to tell tell us about it and then we can work on it. Um, but, but it was, you're not being done to, you're being done with, because it's about us learning and it's about the assessors learning as well. Uh, and, you know, we didn't, yeah, we didn't get an absolute clean bill of health and I knew that that would be the case because I've been going through it. I was still identifying gaps and things we needed to work on. But, you know, we we came to an agreement. These are the things that still need to be worked on. And, and obviously the training and development that database is one of the things that um, yeah, was on the list work in progress. Um, so, yeah, so, so assessment process is really positive for me. Uh, out of it, I've offered myself up to be an assessor going forward, um, and I'm really supportive of the process. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if we've got any questions. Thanks, Daryl, and thanks, Simon. Um, that was a really good session. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? Stunned into silence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sylvia, have you got your Can hand I, up? Yeah. Um, I've got a question to Simon about the electronic ESR. It, how has it been done? Has it been done through aligning ESR finance and health roster together? So one ESR organisation, one cost centre and one health roster. Yes, the health roster, if I'm being honest, we haven't quite got that on the one to one. That's not as critical, but ESR and um, finance, yes, the two mirror each other, with finance being the sort of the lead effectively. Okay. So when you say you've used higher to retire toolkit, is this support in this process? It does mention the position per post work in there. Um, I can't remember what page it's on, but is it, it is in there somewhere? Uh, but if you haven't looked through, you'll find it in there. But it does talk about the positions in there, and it's about it's about the interpretation of sort of how you how you do it. And every organisation will do it probably slightly differently. But within ESR, it has got the functionality to basically allow you to put budget against it. You can do it on bucket positions, or we've done it on unique posts because it will allow the tracking across. So you can then have that identification of that position number goes across into the recruitment system, so that you know what's going on with it. So, so the harder to retire toolkit is quite comprehensive and not everything in it would apply to every organisation. So it's about going through it and picking out the bits that are relevant to you. They're describing best practice and then you can sort of see, well, are we doing it? Can our system achieve it? So it helps you to ask questions and frame the right sort of responses to actually get things done and move things on. Right. Yeah. Because we're currently working in our trust on aligning those together. We've got our HR mm, business partner working with finance together. I'm not on that project, but um, obviously everything's been postponed because of the COVID, but it's working background. So I believe that if we've got any questions, could we contact yourselves for any kind of advice? All I can say is it's not been easy. And we're, we're not, if I'm being honest, we're not 100% there, but mm. the staff list distribution's gone out today, 4th of May, um, June, it'll be mid, mid month. But um, I mean, yeah. obviously, it's a lot of work and gets a lot of information out quite quickly. So, is, is then staffing posts, are these uh, generated through payroll team or 
ESR team. ESR. ESR team. And they go directly straight to budget holders. So finance not meddling with nothing. Finance are not meddling with it. Okay. That's straight out. Um, we've altered the change. We've altered the focus of the team slightly as well by sort of investing in technology and technology training. So rather than just being pure ESR people, they they have a slight sort of IT slant to their to their roles effectively. Right. Um, right. I've got the question about uh, training as well uh, for you, David. Um, Daryl, sorry. It's okay. Uh, right. How did you manage to work out how can you support with the training and development gaps? Have you been running this yourself as a project or did you have a group of people supporting it through the um, accreditation process? Um so it, I guess it'd be fair to say at this point in time, I've probably been taking a major lead in it. I mean, it is, it is my job effectively. Um, but I think we've reached reached a point where I can do no more with my three days a week. So um, one of the other things that had sort of dropped off the, I guess, the headline in terms of our our merger, because we are a merger of two trusts from going back a couple of years, um, was sort of a formal training and development group. So we've just reinstigated that. And, uh, and Simon's actually going to be act acting as the chair. I've man managed to sort of get him as a proper champion. Um, so, th so that's where I think we're going to start moving forward, where it's not just me leading the way. Um, you know, I'm I'm helping, but we're getting more leaders in to 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 move things on. So uh, so we didn't have any apprenticeships in place before I joined the trust. We've we've now we've got about eight or nine now in place. So so I've started to deliver on that. Um, but where we're not not got enough sight at the moment is is everybody getting fair and equal access to CPD. And at the moment we haven't got, you know, we know who's positively getting it. We don't know for sure who's not getting anything or if even if that's the case, because clearly people will have that as part of their appraisal discussion. But we haven't got a means of capturing that and viewing it as at a team or a department level. So that's 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 where we're trying to sort of move things on a bit. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yes. Yeah. Have you? Um... Have you been like supporting the um, internal finance group, so like financial accounts, management accounts, payroll, uh, individually, or was it done as a whole of finance together on individual sessions, team uh, re topic related? So it's, I guess it'd be fair to say that um, there was a lot of work to be done in our operational financial management team, and that's been my main area of focus. And that's one of the other things that sort of in our development plan, which probably wouldn't have got necessarily been associated with the accreditation process per se, but be, yeah, our information is a very finance focus, whereas we have a broader department than finance. And that's what I'm trying to get into now is we've got a clinical coding team, we've got a materials management team as part of, part of our department and, and getting information on what they're doing as well is, is um, is where we're going to next. So we're not just talking about finance, we're talking about the department and, yeah. and making sure it's fair and equi equitable across the whole of our functions. Thank okay. you, Daryl. I think we've got time for one more question before we move on to the next session. Um, Rebecca May Rose, have you got a hand up? Hi. I've got a few question. Um, when you were in your training matrix, I'm assuming is, was that visible to all staff? So was it quite a transparent process? Or was it just for your leaders to see what, what training everybody had? Uh, so, the, so OK, so the, the report um, was obviously approved by leaders, but then it went to a board committee yeah. and I attended that board committee to sort of discuss its contents and then after that
we shared it with the whole of the finance department and talked about what it was doing, what it didn't do and what we wanted it to do going forward. So so that's uh, that was another thing where I was talking about the fact that when I feel we're more open now, whether, whether we were deliberately not open, I think I don't think that was the case. But, you know, we are open in terms of we're, you know, if, if we provide some information and it's relevant to the department, then we should be sharing it with the department and getting feedback. Uh, yeah, so only purely we're literally just gone through level one, trying to get to level two, but it's that how transparent but do we be with the whole team? Some of us thought it was a great thing, but we've had some challenge. Does everybody want their information shared? Which if other trusts are sharing all training information and things like that, it gives us something to say, well, actually other trusts are doing it too because I thought it was a very positive thing to share where everyone's skills are and where we're all at as a team. It's just trying to get that feedback, what other trusts are doing really. So it's good to hear that you guys are moving towards that transparent side as well. So I think that's, yeah, it's, it's how transparent we're going to be. At, very, at the moment, we don't identify information at an individual level, but we are allowing your managers and that individual to have access to it. And I guess with my oversight, then I, I I would like to have access to it. Now, I think it is about asking the department, how do you feel about being as open as you like in terms of that information and, and seeing what, what you get back? Um, thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you, Simon, for that session. It was really good. Um, so we're coming on to our final session. Where I'm going to actually split us into two different groups. Um, we're going to speak about what is the process to achieve accreditation? So that's the process you go through when uh, doing your application, uh, inputting it to us and getting it off to FLC. So um, the Northwest process is slightly different to uh, the national process. So I've put everyone who is from a Northwest organization into a breakout room and David Elcock and Jackie Bowman are gonna run that session. So I'll just open the rooms now and you'll get a notification to move across. Megan, just before you do that, can I just double check? Once we finish this session, is that the end of the of the afternoon? So people will just sign off when we finish our session now. Yeah, yeah, that would be the end. So once you finish in the northwest session, you can like leave once you finish your Q and A. Lovely. Thanks, David. I don't. Um... Okay, so I think everyone that's meant to be in the Northwest room should be in there. But if anyone is from a Northwest organisation, just uh, pop a note in the chat and I'll, I'll add you over to the other room. Um, so I just wanted to run through sort of what the process is for level one and a uh, level two and three on how to get accredited. So for level one, to start with, you will fill in the pro forma, which you can uh, access on the website. Um, once you've filled that in, you contact us at the central team, you send that in to us and we'll read through it, make sure that you've you've reached all the pointers. Um, there's certain areas. Megan? See, yeah, yeah? So I just noticed there's at least one person, possibly two in the chat who maybe should oh, be elsewhere. Sorry. Let me have a little look. We've got Tina Porter and Alison Brown. Two seconds. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, Yeah, I just. OK, so I've just moved them over to the other room. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, once you send in your application to us, we'll read through it and make sure that uh, we're happy to send it on to FLC. There's certain areas where we usually have to they, they're common occurrences where people have issues. So that's making sure that you're level one face certified, you've got your accountancy body accreditations, uh, you have your signed, your FD declaration is signed, and you've used the IND resource pack within um, you've gone through that and made sure that you're hitting all those points. Um, so we'll we'll let you know the changes and then you'll send that back into us and then once we know that we're happy, we'll send that to FLC for approval. Um, sometimes, uh, I think it's been mentioned previously in the session today that if, for example, you've got a really good um, application, but you haven't quite 
got all your ACCA or SIP for accreditation, you're still waiting on them to come through, we can do what we call a caveat. So we'll send your application off to FLC and they'll approve it um, on the condition that you then achieve this your accreditation with the accountancy bodies or you get face certified. Um, and then as soon as you've done that and you've provided the evidence with us, then we'll, we can then provide you with your certificate and your three years of accreditation with us will start from that date. Um, so once the FLC have approved, they've had their meeting and they've let us know, we'll then send you a certificate um, with your level and, and your um, date that it runs. Uh, Giovanna? Can I ask a quick question? <clears throat> We've yeah. got accreditation with SEMA and ACCA, but not SIPFA. Does that make any difference? Because um, I don't think we've got any SIPFA accountants working for us anyway. So you, <clears throat> you don't need to have uh, accreditation with an organisation if you don't have anyone from their work working for you. So you've got no one who's um, a SIPFA who's with sit for you then don't need to have sit for accreditation but, um, if we, but, but if we did have somebody with sit for we would have to have sit for accreditation um yes but that has just changed because sit for has changed their they they've changed their process and they're not updating it they're not renewing it and we've been trying for over a year now to get some information on what they're doing and, and how it's going to work and we've had we had organizations that were waiting for sit for over a year we've said that we, we're not going to hold people to sit for, but for all the other bodies, so ACCA, okay. SEMA and AAT, it will stand that if you have someone working for you, then you do need to be accredited with that organisation. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, do we have any other questions on level one? Yeah, Me sorry. Um, oh. I'll, I'll put a couple in the chat because I'm coming from a very low baseline. So you started off by saying we can get it on the website. I don't know what website we're talking about. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. The Future Focus Finance website. Right. I can pop that into the chat. Um, okay. I'll do that in a second. I'll get that up. Um, and on there, you're, I've just seen your question about yes. what the IND resource pack is. Um, so this is a document that we created within Future Focus Finance to is for organisations to see the sort of level that it would you'd ideally should be working towards within the EDI agenda and at the back of the resource pack there's a checklist um, and that's basically what we're talking about is for you to work through that and make sure that your organisations align to what's in there and that you're working to sort of the best standard possible um, but that can also be found on our website which I'll put I'll put all the links in the chat um, after this session. Um, so I'd to ask another question, and it may be on future focus finance, but um, how do we know what trusts we can maybe um, buddy up with within our own areas? Um, so you could just, if you contact um, us at future focus finance, then we can look into that. We can, because we keep all the data centrally. So who's got accreditation, what level they're at, who's working towards potentially yeah. the same level as you. And then we can, we can do the coordination side of that and put you in touch. Okay, thank you. No problem. Anyone else? Megan, Darryl? I was just going to say that um, you know, we've encouraged uh, sharing as much as possible in terms of um, other organisations submissions to help people along the way. So, um, for example, when I was looking to level two submission, uh, I think Liverpool had done a, um, a webinar recently and and I had that but I also got hold of Leeds teaching hospitals one um, so I had something to sort of baseline myself against so there's a lot of information out there and and yeah and the buddying up is something that we're trying to encourage in our region as well on on the buddying up as well we do hold all every application we've had we save um, centrally so if you also want a hand with a section and you're not sure how to answer it, we can a approach organisations and see if they're happy for us to share their pro forma with you and you can use that as sort of a baseline to go off. So there's lots of lots of things available, uh, lots of support to get you guys through the process and accredited. Um, but yeah, just contact us at any point throughout your process and we're happy to help um, as much as we can. The other thing I might just add in, Megan, quickly is yeah, that how you collect your evidence. So 
when I first started off, I thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if I stick the evidence in the Excel spreadsheet next to next to the section where the information is? The trouble is it gets too big too quickly and becomes unstable. So so we used a word document create created as many PDFs as we possibly could to make the file size small. Um, and, and then we sort of had one word document per section, cut it up using a table and that seemed to work quite well because at the end. So when you get into level two, you know, you're asking somebody to invest some time to do some to, to help you get that accreditation. You want to give it to them on a plate as best as you can. Um, so, so we found that that worked quite well and we got good feedback from the, the assessors for that. Thanks, Daryl. So you lead me on quite nicely to the process for level two and three. Um, so you get a performer uh, very similar to level one. It's just the steps up. But um, like Daryl just mentioned, alongside this one, you have to provide evidence of, of, of you actually doing what you've said you've done. So level one, we take your word for it. Um, but level two, you have to prove that you're doing it. Um, so once you let us know that you want to go for your level two, I will find an assessor uh, or two assessors within your region to pair you with who will go through the process with you. Um, so like Daryl said, they'll, well, they'll look through your, uh, your pro forma and your evidence and they'll decide whether you've provided enough evidence. If you haven't, it's sort of a back and forth between you and the assessor. You work together to make sure that they feel that you've provided enough evidence and you are working to that standard. Um, so once that's happened, you have a meeting, you have a day of meetings. So the asset normally before COVID, the assessor would come to the trust um, to get a real feel for what the organization's like. Um, but now we have to do it all on MS teams. So I think there's about, I think maybe about five or six different meetings throughout the day. They meet with the CFO, uh, they meet with the team that has worked for the accreditation and then they also meet uh, with three or four separate groups of uh, random selected employees to work with about 20% of the finance team um, to see if they agree with what the team is saying the organisation is like and, and the culture and all these things um, and then once this has happened the assessor will go away and write a report, um, a report of uh, the, the best parts of the assessment, some improvement areas, um, and they hand that in to us alongside the pro forma. And that's what the central team will read through. And we will then pass that on to FLC, who will look through it, approve it, and then you receive your three year accreditation. Um, so, yeah, that's both, that's all the processes. Um, uh, Shek, have you got a question? Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, you might not be able to answer it, so maybe one that you take away, which is uh, as we move to ICSs um, and, and they become a formal organisation, I'm just wondering whether we can start looking at accreditation, both for future focused finance and professional bodies as a system, as a sector, uh, because well, we I've... should be really getting common standard across the systems, not just looking at individual organisations. So do you mean uh, like um, going for it as an ICS? Yeah, as ICS. ICS. So you're you're basically getting accreditation for the entire ICS, and all organisations and finance departments within it need to make sure those standards are in place based so on an ICS level. Definitely. So we're we're trying to accommodate to exactly that. So we've actually got a series coming up at the moment that is going to support commissioning organisations to achieve level one before the ICS changes next year and then if for example all the commission organizations in that region have all got accreditation that would then mean that that ICS is accredited and there's no need for them to reapply as as an ICS they can wait till it expires and then go again as a whole um, so we're really encouraging uh, organizations to go for it now to then for in like next year so then that that whole ICS is accredited and everyone's at a similar level um, yeah, and then so, going sorry sorry to interrupt but it was uh so I wasn't necessarily mean talking about commissioning I was talking about ICS as a whole which is providers and the planners together as one so all the trusts all the community organizations that are part of the NHS family you have one accreditation so it's like a sub-region isn't it yeah and if you've so got that one accreditation then you, you therefore it, wanting to uh, change the accreditation requirements a bit to accommodate it 
but you would expect anyone or any organization within that uh, system uh, to have similar sort of standard. We have discussed this and it's something that I think we are going to work towards, but we, when we discuss it, it's all very early stages. You said it would be quite hard to police. Right. Just one application for the whole of a, an ICS, it's going to be quite hard to know that each individual organisation is actually doing that. So it's something that we are looking into and we need to work on the logistics, but it, I think that is the direction it is going to go in eventually. Um, happy sorry, to I'm pilot sorry. one. Happy to pilot one if you're interested in it. OK, um, I'll make a note and when it does come up, yeah. I'll, I'll get in touch. Yeah. Uh, Stephen? Yes, a couple of points. Just picking up on that point about the ICS. Um, I was made aware that sometime last year, Jill Robinson, who did head up, still heads up part of the STP up in Shropshire and Staffordshire, they were looking at doing an STP wide accreditation. So there might be some evidence up in Shropshire and Staffordshire have already taken that a little bit further forward. So um, I don't know whether you can put I, um, put them in touch with one another or whether there's anything that came out of the work that Jill Robinson did that um, you know helps answer that question specifically. I don't know how far along that actually went because I've tried contacting Jill because uh, I think you mentioned this before Stephen yeah. I tried contacting I didn't hear back um, but it's definitely something that we can look into again because it, it is the way it's going to go eventually. Um, I was speaking with Rich my colleague maybe if everyone in a in an ICS does have accreditation then that ICS then gets awarded accreditation and do it that way um, but we'll have to see it's definitely something that is in the pipeline but it's just logistic wise we need to work it all out um do we there's have another point, there's another point i'm going to raise put my hand off for the other <laughs> one i'm just going to say for those people who are going through level two um just from the experience of the three applications i've done there's one thing for me that i think really stands out as a bit of a potentially a problematic point um and it all comes down to there's one of the, the sections it talks about a finance staff development plan and I've had to defer at least two organisations on this one point. I thought it's just worth a minute or so just to explain it. So the finance staff development plan is what it says, really. So you, you, you talk about um, putting a document together that talks about the, the staff in the department, you know, the qualified, unqualified staff, the training and support you give those staff, the training and support you give to budget holders and non-finance people. Um, but also then, you know, what the report is designed to do is come up with a number of objectives that the finance department will see through in the following year. Now, most of the, the trusts I've done have not had a finance development plan in place, but the other things that they don't have either is actually when they come to pull that finance development plan together and particularly look at the objectives, they haven't got anything that really supports why they would have those objectives. So what you typically look to see is that you know, they've gone out, um, had maybe a staff away day, come up with some objectives as a department. They've gone out and done some budget holder surveys to find out what the, the budget holders want in terms of a finance service. And there's a number of things in level two, and largely around that, um, I said that finance staff development plan and those objectives that all go hand in hand. And I say, you know, I've gone through three applications and that has not been in place the first time around in any of those organisations. So I'll just flag it up, you know, those who are going through level two, you know, just look closely at that because it's it's the one that you know I've seen that typically trips people up. Thank you, Stephen. Um, do we have any final questions before we close today? Megan, I was just going to say yeah. that was one of the ones that yeah we, we needed to do some work on the development plan and. Um, and we did, we did have one, but it just wasn't quite fully developed. Um, but I had the time to sort of address it before we'd finalised um, the assessment process. Um, and it still needs to be developed because that's the one where we want to encompass the whole of our department. Um, so, so yes, so that is one that people just need to keep an eye on give it some special attention and these these sections that you're pointing out that are do need a little bit of extra work or they usually trip people up we're hoping to put on sessions that just are specifically for these to help organizations that are struggling to 
get over these hurdles. So hopefully they'll be up and running soon to help everyone cross the finish line, as it were. <laughs> um, OK, well, I think that's us for today then. So thanks so much to all of our speakers and for everyone that attended. Um, if you guys, if anyone has any questions or needs any help with their application at all, just please contact us at Future Focus Finance and I'll pop our website um, link into the chat box so everyone can access it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, everyone. Bye.